Our reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 23. We'll begin in verse 44. Luke 23, 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, we are ever thankful for the sacrifice of your Son. And Father, this morning we are especially thankful for the access that we have into your presence. We eagerly await the return of your Son when we will be drawn home together. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This morning, as we meditate on the cross, I want us to imagine the scene just immediately following Jesus' death. Because his death was attended by many signs and wonders. Luke records one of them here. So from about noon until about three in the afternoon, the sky went dark. Right, during what ought to be basically the brightest part of the day, it's like it's nighttime. Matthew, in his account, tells us that the earth quaked with rocks splitting apart and tombs opening up. And we can read in Matthew twenty-seven fifty-two, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Right, you just... Imagine the chaos of that scene. Just nature completely in revolt. It's in the middle of the day, everything goes dark, the earth starts quaking, and dead people start coming out of the ground. Like, this is just the, the wildest time to be alive. And then so the signs and wonders were so blatant. You know, Luke records for us uh, that the Roman centurion... Uh, overseeing the crucifixions, um, he sees what happens and he praises God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And some of the other accounts record the centurion confessing that surely this man was a son of God. Things, again, it's, the, the signs and wonders are so blatant that even the Gentiles present for it get that something incredible has just happened. But there was another sign, another wonder that attended the crucifixion and Jesus' death, arguably the most important one of them all. And it's one that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all report, that the veil of the temple was split in two. One of the other accounts tells us, Luke doesn't tell us this specifically, but one of the other accounts tells us that it was torn from top to bottom. This morning, I want us to consider the, the powerful symbol of that split in the veil of the temple. Is the splitting of the veil. Well, imagine that. Imagine that you're at a vantage point where you can see Golgotha and you can see the crucifixion. Christ hanged between the two thieves. And you can also turn and see the temple. And perhaps can see just all the way in now. Because the splitting of the veil would have offered an extremely rare glimpse inside the Holy of Holies. 
the beating heart of the temple. <clears throat> it was a space where only the high priest ventured. In him, only once a year, after an extensive ritual of purification that included ceremonial washing and sacrifices to atone for his own sins and putting on of sacramental clothes, it was a very special occasion and one that carried great risk with it. The Lord tells Aaron and his sons in Leviticus 16 that they're not to enter the most holy place just any time they please on pains of death. And that space, the Holy of Holies, was so exclusive because it was the meeting place between God and Israel. It was the place where the Ark of the Covenant rested, which is sometimes referred to as the mercy seat. It was built to depict a throne, which is why it's referred to as a mercy seat. And you have cherubim flanking uh, the, the top of the Ark. It is God's throne in Israel. It is the place where God promised to be really and truly present among Israel. And that is what made that space holy. In fact, in talking about just how exclusive the Holy of Holies was, we're simply talking, we're simply defining what the word holy means. Now, we usually think of that word in terms of goodness or righteousness. Those are secondary meanings of the word holy. The fundamental meaning of holy is that it is set apart or separate. Something that is holy is unapproachable by something unlike itself. And that ought to make some intuitive sense, that God must be holy, really by definition. Because think about it just in natural terms, or perhaps even materialistic terms. How would you even begin to approach God? Imagine yourself starting at zero, right? No, no religion or anything. How would you even begin to approach God? left to yourself with only natural means, you can't even begin to know God, let alone approach Him in any sense of the word. That which is holy can only be known and approached by way of revelation. That is, God makes Himself known and makes Himself available, approachable provides a means and a space for that approach. The temple where this veil was, was a testament to God's revelation and to God's presence in Israel. God revealed himself to Israel and provided them with a means of approaching him. But the veil was a reminder of his holiness his separateness, his otherness. That even though he had made himself approachable to Israel, he was only approachable in a very narrow sense. Again, only by one man, the high priest, only once per year, and only after consecrating himself. That is, only after being made holy enough to approach He's having to, to make sacrifices on his own behalf and wash so that he can enter in without dying. As we witness Jesus die on the cross, at the same time we witness this veil, the veil of separation that covers the presence of God and, and keeps Israel out, we witness that veil split in two from top to bottom, that is, as it were, torn from heaven to earth. And what does that mean? Does it mean that God has suddenly become less holy? Well, no. Rather, it means that through the death of Jesus, 
all of us can become fit to approach the unapproachable. That in his crucifixion and in his ascension, Christ has secured our holiness and opened the way to God for us. This is a major part of the Hebrew writer's argument about the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. And we'll let the Hebrew writer do all of the explaining for us this morning. Hebrews chapter 9. And honestly, it's, it's worth reading the whole chapter, but we're going to focus our attention beginning in verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That is, at his ascension, Christ entered the true holy of holies, entered into the actual presence of God, his heavenly throne, and presented himself as a sacrifice for the sins of all. In another place, the Hebrew writer tells us, this is in chapter 10, verse 19, that Christ is not the only one who enters in by that way. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, and this, this for us is the significance of the tearing of the veil. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Notice what the Hebrew writer is saying here, that that Christ's death and ascension have paved the way for us. The veil is split because he has provided a way for us to enter into the holy places by way of the blood of Jesus. And because of that, he says, since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near... That is, we may approach. Whereas in the past, only one man could truly approach. And him only once a year. The Hebrew writer says, now we can approach. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water testifying to the power of our baptism. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. As disciples of Jesus... We follow the way of Jesus, and that way leads into the holy place, the holy of holies. And the splitting of the veil at his crucifixion, again, shows us not only where the way leads, but what the way demands. That through the work of Christ, we are entering into the presence of the holy God. And going that way requires faith and faithfulness, as the Hebrew writer tells us. That's why he says to draw near with true hearts, that is, with loyal hearts. It's why he tells us to stir each other up to love and to good works. 
Because who may enter into the presence of the Lord? Who can approach that which is holy, separate, distinct from us, only by way of becoming holy? That is, becoming like God, righteous and full of love. And that's why the way requires that we be regular in our assembling together. Right, the Hebrew writer is not just wandering off onto some tangent. Right, Christ has opened the way to heaven for us, therefore go to church. It's not some kind of non sequitur. When we, when we bring up this passage, we're not just trying to stuff the pews. The scriptures describe our worship. This is what the Hebrew writer is doing. is He's tying our worship to the approach, the drawing near. Our worship is drawing near to God. Uh, it was said at the outset of our worship this morning, and, and I, this is a fairly common passage for us to cite whenever we begin our worship, that you know, where two or three are gathered together, you know, there the Lord is among us. We confess that the Lord is present in our worship. The splitting of the veil should remind us what an extraordinary thing this is. Perhaps we take it for granted that we can just you know, we show up to worship and we sing the songs and we pray the prayers and we eat the bread and drink the cup and we hear the word and then we go out the doors and we go home and it's just another Sunday. What the Hebrew writer is telling us is that what we're engaged in at this very moment is we are in the presence of the Lord in a way that, again, in former times, only the high priest could accomplish only once a year. And now, here you and I, you know, Joe and Jane Schmo, get to appear in the Lord's presence once a week. More often even. We get to be in His presence and worship Him. How seriously should we take our worship as we assemble together, knowing that we are drawing near and that the Lord is actually present? How seriously should we take it knowing the cost that Christ, the Son of God, was hanged on a cross, the Creator murdered by His creation to open up this new and living way through the curtain that is through his flesh. And so we draw near now in anticipation of and in preparation for our final drawing near. We are together stirring one another up to love and to good works because we know that one day we will approach the throne in the fullest and final sense that we will meet our Lord in heaven. And so let us draw near with true hearts. We invite everyone to draw near. Christ invites all to draw near. The way to God has been made open for us. If you have not taken that way, we invite you to start on that way. Turn away from sin. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized. Cleansed, as the Hebrew writer says, through baptism. Being immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins and then live faithfully. Whether you need to obey for the first time or if you are in need of prayers, if there is any way in which we can help you to draw near this morning, we urge you make your need known to us by coming forward as together we stand and sing.